Today, we're going to talk about one of the essential components that contribute to the success of every sag after member, your union. This is an episode every member should watch because a union truly is only as strong as its members. Unions are democratic institutions in which members choose who represent them and get a voice on how they're paid and the conditions under which they work. An overwhelming majority of workers worldwide don't have any input on the conditions of their employment, but unions empower workers and with great power comes great responsibility. So today I am asking you, the viewer, to take control of your future and not only learn a little bit about how your union works, but also how you can help shape how it operates. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm SAG-AFTRA Executive Vice President Ben Whitehair. Thank you all for joining us for another SAG-AFTRA program on YouTube. We are joined today by American Sign Language Interpreters, Joe Rivera and Courtney Nimershin. There are a lot of critical components to successful union organizing, and there are many types of campaigns, whether it's a push from a group of employees to unionize their workplace, a concerted effort to create more union jobs, or a campaign centered around a new union contract. Today, we're going to look at the elements of union organizing, and we have assembled a panel of experts from across media and entertainment to talk about these efforts. Hernan Debecki is chair of the National Spanish Language Media Committee at SAG-AFTRA. He's been an active member volunteer for well over a decade. His voice is heard daily on commercials, promos, and movie trailers with over 500 film titles to his credit, including as live signature voice presenter at the Latin Grammy Awards. Hernan has received a variety of notable distinctions, including a Clio Award, a General Motors Award of Excellence, and three Emmy Awards. Ellen Crawford has made her living as an actor her entire life and has been a proud member of SAG and AFTRA and then SAG-AFTRA since 1979. Ellen first became inspired to get involved in organizing when she was playing nurse Lydia Wright on NBC's ER, a role that led her to becoming active in nurse-organized labor movements. She has served on the LA Local Board, the National Board, and as the second vice president of the LA Local. Ellen currently serves as the National Organizing Committee Chair for SAG-AFTRA. Suzanne Burkhead currently serves as SAG-AFTRA National Vice President, Small Locals, Passionate about organizing, she is particularly interested in the challenges found in right-to-work states, or as I say, right-to-work for less. Suzanne is a member of the Dallas-Fort Worth Local and works primarily in commercials, television, corporate educational, and radio. She has spent decades in union service at the local and national level. Amy Keys is a versatile and accomplished vocalist, voiceover artist, writer, producer, and actor. She has toured recorded and performed with artists ranging from Phil Collins and Ringo Starr to Barbara Streisdan and the new metal band Korn. Amy has also appeared on screen as both an actor and singer, most recently in the Kristen Wiig film, Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. <laughs> and last but not least, there's her work as a music writer for film, television, and video games. Mike Nelson is an actor you've probably seen quite a bit of. He's appeared in over 80 national union commercials and has two recurring roles in the new Apple Plus show Shrinking, as well as ABC's Blackish. Mike also has a strong passion for organized labor that led to his current position as the sag after co-chair of the LA Local Organizing Committee and a member of several other union organizations like the CPC, or the Commercials Commercial Performers Committee. Okay, rounding out our panel is Jason Kramer, one of the leading radio DJs in the country. Jason has been blasting some of the best music to the Los Angeles area with his own popular radio show on KCRW for over 23 years. In addition to his work over the airwaves, he's also an adjunct professor teaching and lecturing at universities like USC, UCLA, NYU, Berkeley, and Radio Beijing. What a, a cast of characters here. You all have so much experience, both in the organizing movement as well as in your own careers. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Let's get the show moving. So uh, I want to start with uh, a question for the entire panel. Let's start with the basics. Why, why would workers want to unionize? You all have uh, your own experience in this. You're talking uh, with members throughout and future members, people, of course, in our union, but uh, in other unions and those who have yet to unionize, why why is it that workers would want to unionize? Who wants who wants to take it first? I'll go. 
Suzanne, go for it. uh, The basic reason, uh, there are really three reasons. You have better pay, better benefits, and better working conditions. And those are the the three elements, I think, that really drive people to want to join unions. And it's very... um, documented, actually. The AFL-CIO has statistics about this, and it is true that in states that are very union-dense, have a lot of union density, that uh, those figures are higher. I'll I'll go next. Um, Yeah, I think, uh, for one thing, it's just very basic. You want to have something to say about what you do with your life, how you spend your time. I mean, that's a basic thing we all want. And the fact of the matter is that you're the only person who can advocate for you. Um, If you're alone, that is difficult, obviously, unless you're independently wealthy and you don't have to worry about an employer, but most of us do. And uh, in our situation, it's even more difficult because a lot of the times it's a gig economy where we're going from job to job to job. But as a collective then you have more of a voice. And quite frankly, most businesses, uh, no matter what they are, ours or someone else's, are run by corporations, by financial owners, by, frankly, bean counters. We know what we need on the ground to do our jobs well. And I think that's why anyone wants to join a union, to have a voice, because if, if they can get you cheaper, they will. If they can do anything cheaper, they will. Uh, Even if you have a great boss, they don't really understand what your life is like. You're the only one who can speak for you. And in a collective, you become part of the bottom line as well as a collective. Even with uh, what Ellen was saying, um, it's really a protection of our craft, too. Uh, When she mentioned if there's managers or bean counters or what have you, they don't understand what it's like to be in the arts. And it's a different personality that we have. And that's pretty much it. I mean, Alan, you pretty much knocked it on the, on the head there. Thanks. Yeah. I, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I think what comes up for me is especially I, the, as we see the rise in pro union sentiment, you know, I think we're seeing across the economy that people, you know, people, workers, most, <laughs> most people are saying, Hey, even just the basics that you all were talking about, right? Like, of course, you know, fair payment, safety on set. Uh, and like you said, Alan, I think the um, the power of the collective, right? When we're particularly now, you know, you have corporations that are billion and even, you know, trillion dollar corporations. They, they make more money than many of the countries uh, in the world. And any one person going up against that is extremely difficult, but together we can do that. I'm I'm curious uh how you know uh Ellen let's start with you what are what are the essential components to lay the groundwork for a successful unionizing campaign you have workers who go yeah we believe in this we want to have a say we want to protect our craft I love that you brought that Jason you know in the creative works here but for for anyone what are the what are the components to lay the groundwork for a campaign I think you have to begin with conversations with your fellow workers, your fellow performers, your fellow broadcasters, uh, whatever, uh, your fellow uh, musicians, whatever your group is. And the most important thing to do there is listening. Uh, you really need to listen and discuss your issues. Find your the natural leaders of the group. There will be people who will have more influence. So you start on just one-on-one conversations, clarifying the most important issues, um, and just know, even if you have someone who's giving you resistance, if they're a natural leader, you can't win without them. So you, you just have to have those conversations. I think then you have to move on to a, an education. And so there's listening conversations, education and vision. Um, you have to understand what you want and make a plan to achieve it. It has to be clear. If it's not clear for you, it won't be clear for anyone else. Um, you consider what opposition you'll face and do that realistically because everybody has to realize that. And then you have to pivot and hope as Jan- Jane McAleaf yeah. say, <laughs> and uh, you have to pivot with hope and, and make your strategy and you have to develop that vision of how things can be different and then create a plan 
to do it. It's not just enough to envision it. You then have to strategize. So listening, education, and vision, then action. You have to build that coalition of your collective of people, build their confidence in their unique ability to understand their job and how things can be different, how it can be done, and make a plan, then ask something of every person. You can't just say, that, oh, good, you, you've got it. Thanks, I'm behind you. You have to ask something of every person because if you don't do it, nobody else will. And people have to understand that. And only go public when you have a super majority. You really need to keep everything on um, kind of the QT until you have at least 65% because you can blow your strategy that way. And, and the, the anti-union forces, they will try to get in there and and get the, between you and, and your fellows uh, to tell you why you shouldn't do it. So listening with conversations, education and vision, action. And that's what I would say is, is yeah. the essential components. Building, building support from the ground up and, and working on that. Mike, I see you nodding. Does that uh, match your, your experience? I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Ellen and I have been and working closely in the LA local uh, organizing committee about having these kind of structured one-on-one -on -one conversations and ask listening is the most important, like she said, but also asking these questions and always kind of keeping your eyes on the prize of everything workers in this country have, have, have worked for and fought for. Uh, was because a group got together and fought against management to get that management or a corporation has never been like, you know what, we're going to give you the weekend because we're nice, or we're going to give you the eight hour workday or child labor laws or any of those things we've achieved is because a group of people were fed up and banded together to fight to, to earn those, those hard fought wins. So asking those questions, if someone's kind of teetering or on, on the fence about something, you can just ask the point blank question of, if we do nothing, if we sit on our hands and we are cool with the status quo, do you think our plight will improve or, you know, go down, go down the drain? And we all know the answer. The only way we achieve stuff is by fighting for it. And you got to have, like Ellen said, you have to find the right leaders that know kind of the structures within your particular uh, workspace that can get everyone on board because you always know the other side is always going to push back. They're going to hire, you know, consultants that are anti-union. They're going to show you anti-union stuff in the break room and put up flyers and all this stuff and scare people. Cause when it comes down to voting to organize, when people get in that booth, it's like in the, in the voting booth in November, like people have a tendency to get scared or nervous and, and go with what's safe. And they hear these things of, you know, you're lucky to have a job or we might move your jobs overseas or we might all these scary tactics that are used in every anti-union campaign. So all of these things are just just reiterating that fact of if we do nothing, nothing's going to improve. We have to band together. And that's the only way we, we win anything. Yeah, I want to build on that. Jason, I'm curious to hear from you first. Um, <clears throat> when people attempt to unionize, there is often uh, stiff resistance and, you know, even intimidation from their employer. And I'm curious your thoughts and then, and then from anybody else, you know, how can workers maintain their momentum? Yeah. You know, I mean, like Mike was saying, there's a lot of anti-union that happens. And I think it's important to note too, that people who do union, it's not a, it's us, it's not an us versus them necessarily, because we obviously love our job and we love our job so much that we want to make sure that, you know, all for one, one for all, that we all win at our jobs. We want everybody to succeed at what we do. Um, as far, I mean, what, what, it's just, can you repeat the question then, Ben? Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, how, how do you keep the momentum? And I, and I think part of what you're saying around that is, uh, you know, keeping the big picture in mind, but it's like when you're facing that resistance, like Mike was saying, you know, it can be scary and it's like, oh my gosh, I, to your point, like, I'd love this job. I don't want to lose my job. So how do you maintain that momentum uh, in building towards that union effort? It's just a constant drilling. Um, it's constant reaching out to folks. Uh, we're doing it right now. I mean, we have these little pizza parties where we get people together. We get on these Zoom calls every week. Uh, we 
do one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. You know, we don't want it to disappear. And we've already seen uh, it kind of happen. I, I just was reading today that NPR just had a, um, an article going out, if unions are big, then why isn't anybody joining? And I believe a lot of it has to do with outreaches. It has to do with, with, with folks that work at a company who are not used to having a union. We're a fairly new union. Uh, we're an organization that just fairly became SAG-AFTRA. And there's still people that don't understand. When people are newly hired, management may not tell them about the union. And from what all, you know, all they know is it's going to be, we're going to work here and we could get fired at any time. So it's up to us just to constantly drill into their heads that, yeah, you do have protections. We are here for you to make it more, bigger, better. True. Yeah. Yeah. Ernan, I see you uh, nodding. Is that, uh, has that been your experience? You've been very involved in a lot of different campaigns and talking with communities. What are the, what are the elements that stand out to you? You know, if if somebody watching is a union member and says, yeah, like, I believe in this, I want to help, you know, how how what what words of wisdom do you have for them? Well, I think the, the first word that comes to mind is when you belong to a union, you feel empowered because you're surrounded yourself uh, by other people who uh, have knowledge of um, how the, in this, the forces in the industry work. And uh, those examples that uh, I think Jason or Suzanne were putting out there, uh, you know, the abuses that people uh, can go uh, to prevent people from joining a union, uh, I can name those and more uh, when uh, we talk about our community, the Spanish language community. Um, I can give you an example where before, you know, the Telemundo contract was signed with sag -Aftra. Uh, actors were afraid. They were scared out of their minds to, uh, uh, you know, uh, even talk about e joining the union because uh, management at that time was putting out a lot of resistance, you know, of course. Uh, what happened after that was that uh, over 80% of the actors in the, in the vote uh, th at that time in Telemundo voted yes. And then things changed. And when you speak to people who were in the process of making change happen, uh, it wasn't easy. The, it wasn't easy for them to make this decision of joining a union. Um, but um, the fact that they could see uh, that their own conditions will change dramatically. They would have, they would get uh, breaks in their work. They would have protections, they would have all kinds of, uh, you know, the good things of joining a union, uh, aside from the pension and health benefits, uh, it, it, all, it all changed. It, all, uh, it, it came to a point when people realized that they, they, uh, they, have, they have their, their own power to be empowered by joining the union. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amy, I'm curious, your, your words of wisdom in this space as someone who's worked hard uh, in, in a different section of creatives, other, other pieces that have stood out to you that have been especially helpful? Well, mainly being completely honest about how this is not an easy road to take, unionizing and fighting against the status quo, because let's be honest, the status quo works for the companies. They're happy. They're happy to stay there and they're going to do everything. And explaining that just on a grassroots level, basic level to people that, of course, we're going to get below back because the status quo works for them. It does not work for us. However, we're not totally, as uh, Jason was saying, we're not totally adversaries. It's not you know, us against them but we need to find a common path. So that's one thing, being straight up with people about the work that has to go into it. Secondly, getting rid, there's so much legal ease that goes back and forth on a lot of this stuff. What I've discovered is the easiest way to reach people is to find real life examples. Like this is going to put more food on your table because 
This is going to give you more time with your family because this will protect you if you are ill. This will provide health care for you and your family because dot, 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 dot. I found that giving people real life examples like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I didn't get that or, oh, I didn't realize that we could do that. Giving them real life examples is what I've discovered has made, has created the most movement when I've tried to bring people into the fold. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, Suzanne, you've, you've done this work and particularly in, you know, uh, your state, but, you know, and with other workers in states where it's particularly challenging given the, the laws of those states. I'm curious, are there, are there pieces Obviously, there's additional challenges, but are there are are the the things that we've been talking about the the things that you come back to? Are there other other things that you found to be effective? Um, I think I agree with uh, what other people have said. Um, I would say that you, um, of course, you're keeping it uh, one to one as as, mo as much as you can, but you need to keep it personal. Um, what are the individual's issues, and you? offer a way to solve those issues. Mm -hmm. And I always, um, I always imagine, this is probably a cliche, but I imagine the, the little ant trying to push something up the hill all by itself. And then you gather all the ants and they're able to push that up much more easily than they ever imagined. And so that's part of the, um, the solidarity issue, um, coming together as a group, um, finding your common goals, and working together to make it happen. Yeah, I love that. Ernan, there were some pretty significant gains made for voiceover artists in the 2022 Netflix agreement, particularly for the Spanish language dubbing community where union density is pretty low. I'm curious, how has the success of this Netflix agreement affected efforts to increase um, you know, union density so that Spanish language dubbing artists can enjoy the benefits of a union contract? Well, I think this new contract with Netflix is a tremendous, uh, you know, step forward uh, to getting more people interested in joining the union. Um, you know, traditionally, Spanish language uh, dubbing has been made non-union. It's always been made outside of the U.S. For, for, uh, to begin with. Um, and whenever it, it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, done in the U.S., it was non-union. Uh, traditionally, Mexico, Argentina, and other countries um, have taken basically the bulk of the work. And this presents... Uh, problems, but also presents opportunities. I think when Netflix joined uh, SAG-AFTRA in this wonderful contract, they realized um, that it was going to be for their own benefit to be able to sign up people uh, in the United States uh, to do the Spanish language that's spoken in the United States. And that would basically, you know, uh, benefit their own, their own bottom line. And so I think this contract is a win, win, win. You know, we the members win, uh, SAG-AFTRA wins, and all of the members of SAG-AFTRA win too, because every dollar that comes in is good for all of us. And of course, the industry benefits from it. So, Yeah, I, I appreciate what many of you have said around, you know, the win-win mentality of, around this. Like, of course, we are talking about workers' rights and the treatment of workers, but you know, my, my experience and, and the data to me is very clear, uh, you know, shockingly when people are treated well and make a living wage, they produce a better product and they're more loyal to the company. And, you know, the, this is not, Hey, workers are here to ruin the company. It's like, Hey, if everybody is succeeding, the company's going to succeed and we want the company to succeed. You know, i any job I do, I'm like, I want it to be the most successful job there's there's ever been. And I think keeping keeping that in mind and and hopefully as we continue to do this, that will that will continue to be uh what what the companies realize as well. Uh and un until then we'll we'll you know fight as needed. But I'm curious, um, Mike, let's come to you. What what can workers do to ensure that their efforts to unionize are successful? 
Well, like everyone's alluded to, it it takes work and it's not just a one and done thing. If you're doing a campaign, you got to find you, you might not pick the right leaders right away or your your first stress test or getting people to take a survey or to sign up for something to find out how how much solidarity you have might fail one, two, 20 times. But it's this continuing work. The personalization that people talked about, the one-on-ones, and then follow-up is huge. Like even if you're you're working towards a goal, it's like Jason was talking about the pizza parties, the coffee shops, the one-on-ones, talking in your workspace, whatever that is, whether it's structured or unstructured, is finding these these places to continually talk and work at that because it is going to be tough when it comes down to the main vote or signing that card or whatever. It's like you're going to get a ton of pushback from the other side. So I love what Amy said too about telling people realistic and no one wants to be the first person. Everyone's like, what's the word on the street? And if they hear that, Hey, we did a survey of all the people that work here and like 80% filled it out. And we have these top three issues that everyone's talking about. That's a great sign that you're going to, you're going to find some common ground and, and have a successful campaign. Yeah. To not feel alone, Jason, I'm curious why, uh, why did your station KCRW unionize and and what are the benefits that you secured in that first union contract? Um, all right. Really fast. I want to say something that, that Mike was talking Please. about too, to interject off of that. One thing, too, that I think that really works effective is is inner uh, union sports and games, things like that, uh, or get mm. together. You know, I mean, talking a little old school here, but. If you get other radio stations who are also unionized or other TV stations and you all get together, you're going to have a bigger power, you know, in numbers than just your own little station. So people would like to see results rather than not, you know, uh, to give an example, my old life, I was an EMT and I was a teamster. Um, and you talk about money. People who were working on an ambulance back then were not making hardly any money. And you would end up having to be a teamster and then work with other companies and other ambulance things and see other firefighters and paramedics and, and get together. And the reason I'm saying this is because we look at this as just kind of an entertainment world. But outside of entertainment and sag after there are unions for teachers. There's unions for uh, working in car shops There's or, or factories, working as EMTs. So there's all these different companies who are union and the more power we get together and every union gets to see the effectiveness of what other unions do, I think kind of even builds a stronger uh, foundation. But as far as like KCRW, we were essentially kind of in a, a, a world turmoil because we became union before the pandemic and it was really because Emerging technologies in our field have changed hugely uh, with the DSPs like Spotify and Apple. And that was starting to take away from our, our listenership. And as we all know, we make our money either via commercials or underwriting. That's where it comes from. And advertisers are just not going to put their money into companies that are not having any viewers or listeners. And with DSPs growing and Spotify and all those numbers going away, we are losing our new audience. We still may have in public radio, we have our 40 year olds, our late 30s and 40s and 50 year olds as a core audience, but eventually we still need to going to grow. And we are starting to lose that because we have a generation who is a young millennial or Gen Z that does not listen to the radio. And so those numbers are starting to come in and the ratings are going down. Um, as we all know, our, our Nielsen ratings, you know, it used to be in radio, uh, top ratings would be maybe 14, 13 points at a given time. Now they're down to six for the highest station. And the only station that actually fluctuates really high is, is a station called Coast. And that's during Christmas time where it goes to what it used to be. And that lasts for just one time. So when we see these ratings go down, it kind of makes us worried. And Knowing that, like any company, if the ratings go down and the money's not coming in, they're going to start laying off people. And that was our, our first inkling is, yes, we need to start securing, making sure that as a station, especially a public radio station, that we protect our workers. 
And we ended up after about a year or so of negotiations and working around it, we became a member of SAG after. And now we're into our third year and we are doing bargaining again. And so far it, it's been a, a pleasant experience. There hasn't been a lot of pushback. Um, we now are dealing with equal pay, which we never had before. Again, the misconception of public radio, just because it seems like it's public doesn't mean that we get less than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so happy to have you all as, as part of the uh, SAG-AFTRA family and, uh, again, to me, what I am <clears throat> really inspired by is, you know, a lot of what you all are talking about is, you know, doing, doing the work and having those conversations and that it's, it's not an overnight thing and that it continues even once you've got a union contract, you know, continuing to build and keep those conversations alive and keep people engaged, uh, because, you know, the, the next elements of the workplace that people, you know, that the workers want and need are, are going to take that continued effort and, and work. Amy, I'm curious from, to hear from you what it's been like working under a union contract in the, in the music industry. It's actually been really, really wonderful. Um, one great example that I was just thinking about, um, the company will remain nameless, but uh, we had been out, we were in New York on Broadway in the middle of the night till about 4.30 in the morning. And then they wanted us on Chelsea Harbor to rehearse the very next morning. And let's just say craft services was not all it was supposed to be cracked up to be, et cetera, et cetera. And someone called SAG-AFTRA immediately our SAG after, well, our after um, representative came down and said, okay, who do I need to speak with? And got things shut down and literally changed the face of what was happening for an entire cast of people, which was amazing to me. This was, I was kind of a newbie in all of this. So that, that was wonderful. Also, I sit on the um, singers committee and I'm the head of the committee that um, deals with the touring agreement. Generally, as a singer, I hate to use the word, but eh, no, it is kind of like that. I get punished for being successful because I, the bulk of my monies or the bulk of my work generally comes from touring, which for the longest time did not come under the union umbrella. Well, with this touring agreement, now, when I'm successful, when I get a tour, if I can get my company to sign on to this agreement, then my funds that I make from that monies will go towards my H&R, which is life changing. And we're talking to a group I've been sitting on a committee that's actually reaching out to the hip hop community, because at, I guess the nature of the beast is we're all kind of our individual artists in our own little boxes thinking this is my thing. I'm, we're not, you know, us working together is not going to work. But sitting down and talking to hip hop artists, R&B artists, pop artists, and let and helping them realize that as a group, we have power. And then also with this touring agreement, which is where a lot of hip hop artists make their money. Most of the big, not everybody is, you know, a Jay-Z. There's hundreds and hundreds of other folks who are just trying to keep food on the table who go out and tour 90% of the year, but get no benefit from that. So speaking to them about this contract could possibly change their lives and their families' lives by providing them with health and retirement. So this has been being a part of the union has been a game changer for me. We, uh, <clears throat> SAG AFTRA's national executive director, Duncan Crabtree Ireland was just on a panel at South by Southwest talking, uh, with other members in the hip hop community. And, uh, it was powerful to see, you know, these hip hop artists going, wait a second, I might have access to healthcare. Wait, hang on. What's going on. And I, uh, Amy, I loved your example about, you know, being able to literally change what was happening at 4 a.m., which is insane. Uh, yeah. The to me, what I think is so powerful is that you know there is someone 
to call, you know, as a union member, because I think about that, you know, if you're on that set by yourself and there's no union, I mean, who are you going to call? What do you, what do you, you know, what, what option do you have? And if you're not a celebrity with your own power and a team who that, you know, yeah, sure they can bend. And then maybe it's just happening for you, but to say, no, actually th- this is on in that example, right. Even just unsafe, like <laughs> your humans need sleep. Uh, and that you have someone to call that there's professional and that there's, you know, uh, something that you can actually do and that you have access to 24 seven. Yeah. And you have power. That's been my yeah. main thing to reach out. That's been my main thing as far as outreach goes. It's like you have power because most people in the music industry, we, we've been taught, carefully taught, as the song says, that the companies are here and you are the ant upon whose back they stand and make their money and you have no power we take your money and oh yeah all that money that we just gave you there's a recoupment clause so we're going to get it all back it's that kind of david versus goliath thing but i want them to know that sag after is the slingshot david can can knock goliath out if we all stick together and like you said for the hip-hop community I, I mean, literally people's jaws were dropping and they're like, I can actually do this. Wait a minute. The record company told me it's like, no, 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 no. This is what your rights are. This is the power that you actually can wield if you come under this safety under this umbrella of safety, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, also at the music um, business, it, there's not any real contract for working on a specific uh, item or show. If you, like Amy was saying, you could get dropped tomorrow from whatever you're working on. No, no reason why. Maybe they just don't see it working. And with the way that music works today, you're only as good as every day you work. And you got to work really hard in this business. And the fact is that If you, like Amy said, if you have power behind you, if you got that motivation, it keeps you somewhat in place. I mean, I've I've known, I can't tell you how many artists I know that did great. And, but however, everything they're doing is based off of streaming Mm -hmm. and a label who actually takes a lot of portion. If you're assigned to a label, they take a huge chunk of your money. It's not what we, what most people think. They actually take a huge chunk of your money and you may not even see a dime of that money because if you got uh, money ahead of time, you still have to recruit that. And that could still take years. And after it's said and done, they're still, you know, taking money. They, in, in fact, they actually take fees yeah. before you even recoup. So you get to recoup and they take fees for any money that comes in. Oh, yeah. And your contract says that they can choose to drop you at any point at any time everything that they give you all of these folks out here oh let's we'll give you a car yeah go buy a house yeah but that million dollars that we gave you to make this album is completely recoupable so you're in debt immediately and then when the next record comes out when you make the next one you go into debt yet again everything is recoupable so the artist that was a like perfect example when TL, the TLC documentary that they did, where it was like, how do you have the biggest song on the planet and you're in debt? So, yeah. you or, know, you know, it's, or the shock when people learn that, you know, the artists are not paid for songs that play on terrestrial radio. And yes. we're working on that, you know, uh, AMFA, the American Music Musician Fairness Act. That's crazy. How are artists not getting paid when their songs are on the radio? That's, yeah. that's most people don't realize that because I sat on the Grammy uh, governor's board and at Grammys on the Hill. You go to speak to congressional members and explain to them that, you know, it's like everybody knows Aretha Franklin's respect, but most people do not realize Aretha got no, not a dime for every time. And that's probably playing right now somewhere in the world. Guess who gets paid? the Otis Redding estate, because Otis, respect was a cover actually. And Otis Redding cut it first and wrote it. 
So as the writer, producer and all that, he gets paid. The singer does not get paid. All of that, all that music on the Titanic soundtrack, Celine Dion got paid because she's a Canadian citizen and they paid to rep for terrestrial airplay. Yeah. Nobody else singing on there gets played. And we leave a ton of money. Side note, we leave billions of dollars overseas because there's no reciprocity because we don't pay anybody for their artists being played here. So they're like, fine, you won't pay us. We won't pay you. We'll collect the money, but we won't give it to you. So we leave billions of dollars over there. So well, and that's, another, that's another component yeah. that I meant to say is education letting people know exactly what's going on in this industry because it's like the wild it's treated like the wild wild west for the most part yeah yeah well one one other challenging topic suzanne i want to talk with you about and then we'll we'll get some thoughts from everyone on on some words of words of wisdom suzanne uh for anyone who doesn't know can you explain what a right to work or right to work for less state is for anybody who's not familiar with that term um, and what your um, what some of those obstacles and and perhaps even successes in the in the face of those obstacles have been for you in in doing that that work? Sure, uh, being in a right to work state means that you can work under a union contract and never pay dues, never pay fees. So you get all the advantages that a union contract has to offer but you never have to join. And so we have, you know, a whole series of, of freeloaders who are taking advantage of the union, but they're not putting anything back toward the union. And it's a very, um, it, it can create an adversarial situation uh, between performers, even on a set. Um, but it's, it's there's, there's kind of a beauty to it as well. Because in a right to work state, people who join the union have chosen to join. They have found a reason, they have found meaning to it. And uh, what, what I've found is that in a right to work state, um, you organize hearts and minds. And so much uh, really depends on community and really building that community uh, within a market, um, uh, across work types, um, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm imagining you know, the little, the people in their little boxes, um, once they realize that they're, they're part of something, part of a group, part of a community, then you're able to not feel threatened by someone else. And uh, what, what you become then is a leader in the entertainment community, in uh, your market, uh, because you have created something very strong. So even though it's, you know, there's so much about it that's not fair, um, but there is a lot about it that is inspiring as well. I love that. I love that. Well, as we're working towards... Um, the end here. I'm curious, uh, two different pieces of advice, but the first one is, um, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but as, as we've gone in the conversation, your, your words of advice to workers looking to unionize, they're not part of a union yet. What is, what is your, what are your words of wisdom to, to people in that situation? I, I'm going to take this one up. Um, you know, um, Maggie Russell Brown, uh, Russell Brown, um, in one of the meetings that we've had uh, with the Spanish Language Committee, um, she showed us this cartoon of what the uh, union means. And I just wanted to describe this cartoon to you guys. It's the um, when, when you are not in a union, you're like a little fish. And then there's this huge fish that is, you know, ready to eat you. But when you are in a union, the huge fish becomes all of the members that belong to the union, and then the industry becomes a little fish. 
if you can picture that this in your mind, this was the best example to me what a union means. And uh, I want to thank Maggie. I don't know if we can share it or not, but I think it's very powerful and, and uh, a very powerful image to show you know that the union means empowerment and uh the more you know people we can get to sign up to become a union member at sag after the more power we'll have i love that i love that i i think what amy and many other people were talking about is really the key advice which is to um to begin with one-on-one -on -one conversations real honest one-on-one -on -one conversations and then and what is sometimes hard when you're passionate about it is you want to just talk at people. I just want to say, here's what you should know and here's what's available. But what you really need to do is ask questions, find issues, and really listen more like 70% or 30% talking because they need people. First of all, you'll learn something. And second of all, people won't be talked at. They'll become part of the movement, part of the solution. So that's one of the bits of advice I would give. Mm. Well, I totally agree with Ellen. And also, I found that have asking someone, I say, tell me what you've heard about being in a union. What, is, what do you know about that? And address those concerns. And then ask them, and... and Get them to ask ask questions or to say, okay, what bad things have you heard? What did they tell you that's going to, that's going to happen? And say, oh, they said this is going to happen. Well, actually, blah 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 blah. You know that 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 FAQ section. Be that FAQ section. You know, have those answers for people, but let them voice. Let like Ellen was saying, let them speak. Let them tell you yeah, this is what I've been told, or this is what I think a union does or can't do, and address that. And then that tends to have them go, oh, really? Oh, okay, tell me more. Then they lean in, and that's when you've got them, and you can start filling in the gaps and correcting misconceptions about things. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Mike. You look like you got a thought. Go for it. Yeah, I, I think what's what's always kind of gets me excited is to think about every successful union campaign from, you know, hundreds of years ago till yesterday or today is it starts with two workers talking to each other, finding a common pain point and just willing to stand up to management or, you know, your boss and saying this isn't fair. This isn't respectful. Um, that's where it starts. You have these grand pictures of we need to get everyone and the big picture and all that stuff is great, but it starts simply with just that thing of just one other worker uh, to kind of lock arms with you and, and start that process. That's something to just begin. Don't think of how hard it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be hard, but it just simply starts with that, that first conversation. So to just to remember that. Yeah. Jason or Suzanne, anything to add? And then I also want to hear from all of you, you know, to me, the other piece of this is how union members can support their union. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the value of joining a union. And once, once you are a member, though, what is it that you can do to fight for, you know, fairness and the contracts and, you know, all the things that are going to bring a better and better future for everybody? How can people get involved and support their union once they are a member. Yeah, as you know, as Mike was saying about it, it starts with two people and it, it's good for those two people to go to other folks who are union and learn and understand how to build a union within your own organization. Um, that's why everybody is here. Um, one thing about the union I, for the advice is it, it just gives you a good peace of mind. Um, we live, you know, we were talking about employee at will. That also means fire at will. And that becomes really scary. And you don't become a productive member of your workforce if you feel like you're always on eggshells all the time. And if you have a collective group that you can work through stuff or, you know, you're able to protect yourself if maybe your boss doesn't like you, they just can't fire you for willy nilly. 
you know, there has to be an absolute reason. So you don't feel as scared going to work. And it just seems to get worse and worse these days, uh, especially with Ellen was saying the gig economy. But, you know, saying that, it, the union is such a cool entity. You know, I've been around it my whole life. And you just feel like, you know, you belong to another organization that's there for you um, outside of your own place at your work. And you, you feel like you do have those extra protections. Yeah, I love that. Suzanne, what are your, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> well, I think um, the first thing that I would say to uh, a union member uh, would be to uh, listen to what's going on in the union and then show up. Maybe it's just marching in a parade. Um, maybe there's a, a work action. Um, whatever it is, just show up. Come to your uh, annual membership meeting. Um, attend a conservatory event. And once you start participating, in even in a small way, you may get interested in giving more. And then you look for your passion. What is it that really inspires you? Or what really is your big pain point? Um, for me, I had uh, issues with agents. And so I became involved and uh, got on our uh, agents relations committee at the time. And um, you realize that you, you participate and then you make gradual changes. So once you have done those things, then you have uh, another world that opens up to you. Uh, you can run for office, run for a convention delegate, run for your local board. Um, and these are more opportunities to participate and uh, grow as a person and grow as a leader. Mm, I love that. And so many different ways to do it. Mike, how can union members be involved yeah, I, I, I like here's here's a here's a real simple one. And this is something we're kind of working at on the local committee level is just for people to take the the new and improved orientation. It's a three hour online presentation. I just did it recently and I learned a ton and I've been involved for quite some time. So that's one. Take the orientation. I don't care if you've been in the union for 50 years or five minutes. It's like take the orientation and you're going to learn. Even if you get a skosh of what they present to you, you're just going to have a way bigger overview of what the union does and what it doesn't do. And you're going to learn so much and it's great. Um, and then there was one other thing is something that breeds solidarity that just blew my mind. And when you get involved, if you show up to a wages and working conditions meeting, or if you talk to a friend that's in leadership or whatever, and you just learn how many hundreds of your fellow members are volunteering their time for the betterment of the entire 160,000 membership if that doesn't blow your mind or make a, another step towards the union, I don't know what will. So just learning that there's so many people giving so much of their free time to help others uh, always fires me, up, but makes me feel like I got to be involved. I have to. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. what's funny is we live vicariously through movies and shows. And after we leave a movie, we're really amped up. You know, you watch a Fast and Furious and you're racing down the street. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Watch a movie about a, a 1950s union. You're out there. You're ready to go march in the street. If, if folks would keep that same attitude and feeling going and understand, you know, as, as that movie we just saw, then, yeah, it, it's, it's a win-win. It, but it, it's going out there and making sure that we actually do it. Yeah. Ernan. Oh, Ellen, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to address something about um, thinking of the union as a separate thing, uh, which I think is a can be a problem because also your employers try to, and anti-union people try to say, well, it's getting in the way of you and your work. But it's important to, to rather than say, well, I hear the, the union sucks. Well, no, uh, you need to learn. Uh, what's going on and open your emails that, that, that are sent out. Oh, look at social media because you might learn that that problem that you have has al already actually been solved. And it's just that you don't know it's been solved. So you can't advocate for yourself. Also, if something is wrong on a set, 
as as Amy gave an example, call because they can't fix it if they don't know about it. Uh, they, we can't fix it. Your colleagues can't fix it if they don't know about it. And it's really important that we think of ourselves as the union. I know we keep saying you are the union, but you really are the union. And that's how we win is, is not to say, what are they doing for me? But what are we doing for ourselves? And, and be knowledgeable about what actually has been accomplished. Sometimes it's been frustrating to me. And I have people say, well, nobody's doing anything about this. And I go, well, actually, we are. And you can be a part of that. So I think that's how you support the union is to actually know what's going on. And then when there is something you want somebody to know, to report it to your colleagues, to report it to your staff. And also to realize that you don't have to be a known star to have power in this organization. We, when we speak of we, it's, it is truly we, us, all of us. So, because I know a lot of folks until they get educated about it, are like, oh, well, I'm not on TV. I'm not this, I'm not that. My, this project is small, doesn't matter. Know that you have power in the union because you are the union. Yeah. Hernan, final <laughs> words of advice on getting involved. Yeah, from my own experience, uh, you know, at the uh, first at the task force and then at the committee, we uh, from time to time we, we organize meetings and workshops. And one of the workshops that we uh, organized before the, you know, um, the the big uh, uh, pandemic time uh, was about dubbing. And in that meeting, we basically invited some members who were experts at dubbing, and we had a few uh, hours of uh, different uh, talks and uh, hands-on experiences and all. But we didn't only invite members of sag -AFTRA. We opened it up to everybody. And um, as I remember that meeting that we had at the um, Cagney Room, uh, the, it was a full meeting. The, there was no more room. It was completely filled up. We had to open up, uh, you know, some more space for other people to, to, you know, because we didn't have enough space. And so the, the fact that you belong to SAG-AFTRA is such an honor. And you have to be so proud of that. When you look at other people who want to join and they look at you and look, look, they look up at you. They want to join you. And to have this in your pocket means a lot. And, uh, it's a, so it's, 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 it's a, a reflection of a, a group of people who are dedicated, artists who know what they're doing, and it's a symbol of excellence, you know, uh, to belong to sag -Aftra. And so when you spread that out, then hopefully you'll get some people to join you. Here, here. Well, to all of our panelists, Hernan, Mike, Suzanne, Jason, Amy, Ellen, <coughs> So very much appreciate you taking the time and volunteering to be with us here today. And uh, it's uh, very inspiring to hear from all of you. And like Mike was saying, just to see fellow members who are volunteering their time for the, the betterment of all of us, because I know in all of our different respective creative careers, we love the work that we do and we want to keep doing it. And we want uh, our fellow creatives to be able to, to do that. So thank you all so much for being here today. As a reminder to everyone watching, this presentation is available as a replay on our YouTube channel, along with a whole library of programs on important and informative topics for our members. So be sure to share, subscribe, uh, send the video to your, to your friends. And on behalf of the whole team here at SAG-AFTRA, thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks to our regular viewers who've been tuning in each week for our educational live streams. If you have ideas for topics you would like us to cover, please send us an email at pteoe at sagaftra.org. And until next time, stay strong. Very much appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.